First of all, what is a resource poor country? There are a lot of definitions, but uh, according to the World Bank and UNDP, a poor country may be defined by an index called Human Development Index, HDI, that takes into account life expectancy, education, and income. Under 0 0.8, uh, the country is considered as a less developed country, and under 0 0.5, it's in brown on the map, country is considered a resource poor country. And as you can see, the majority of these countries belong to the sub-Saharan Africa. So my talk will be mostly focused on Africa, also because I work in Africa, of course. So why talking about uh, HBV in resource-limited uh, country? Because first, number one, it's frequent, and number two, it's very serious, and number three, it's neglected. To manage HBV in poor resource uh, setting, uh, we will see, I will show you that it's very challenging, but it's feasible. But to do it, we have to get accurate data an explanation about this epidemic in poor countries, and we have to set up actions. And I will give you a great example about what we do today uh, in West Africa. So data, as you know, almost 400 million people are infected with viral hepatitis B worldwide. And as you can see, the majority of high endemic countries are in Africa, and in Southeast Asia. Now, if we come back to the first map I showed you on poverty, you can see that viral hepatitis B fits perfectly with underdevelopment and poverty. Chronic hepatitis B is a serious disease because it can lead to cirrhosis in one to four percent of uh, the cases with the risk of decompensation and liver cancer and, of course, death. So, as regards the number of cases in the world, we can now understand why HPV is a major cause of death. Indeed, HPV infection is the tenth leading cause of death worldwide, and more than 50% of liver cancer are due to viral hepatitis B. And liver cancer is also a major cause of death in, in the world. It is the fifth most common malignancy, uh, leading to 500,000 annual deaths. And these deaths occur in poor countries, as you can see in this map. Uh, this is a map about liver cancer, and the majority of this liver cancer occur in Africa and Southeast Asia in poor countries. And so 80% of these deaths uh, are observed in less developed regions. And in this part of the world, liver cancer is the third malignancy in resource-limited countries. This is data from Global Can 2008. Let's have a look now in Africa. Liver cancer is a major cause of death the first malignancy in males, and the second in, uh, in females. I say second because in West Africa, it's the second cause of death after uh, cervical cancer. So you can see that liver cancer is a major problem in Africa. And viral hepatitis B accounts for almost two-thirds of these HCC cases in Africa. So definitely viral hepatitis B is a huge issue. And it affects young people because the mean age of presentation in Africa is very, very low, 33 to 48 years according to different studies. So people die and they die early in the life. If you look now at the figures in South East Asia, liver cancer is a major killer, is the second malignancy in men and the fifth malignancy in female. And again, viral hepatitis B accounts for almost 80% of 
HCC cases. So why is viral hepatitis B uh, such a big problem in uh, poor countries? First of all, infection occur early in the life. In Africa, in transmission occurs mostly from child to child before the age of five years old. And in Asia, transmission mostly occurs uh, through mother-to-child transmission at birth. So why it is a problem? Because we know that the earlier you get infected in the life, the more you will be able to develop chronic viral hepatitis. As you can see in this figure, you're, when you are infected uh, early in the life, the risk of chronic hepatitis is very high, 30 to 90 percent. By contrast, adult acute infection will uh, lead to chronic hepatitis only in 5 percent of the cases. So we estimate that 25 percent of adults infected during childhood will die early from liver cancer or cirrhosis related to viral hepatitis B. So why this early infection? Because we have a vaccine available since 1982 and very effective. And in addition, WHO developed a huge immunization program in the 90s particularly in Africa. But that's theory, because in practice, if you look at these figures, that's very alarming because the percentage of coverage for HBV vaccination is still very low, uh, less than 50% in Asia and less than 80% in Africa. This is also alarming figure from a recent review, and it's very interesting review. It has been published in 2012. You should read it. And you have this nice map. You can see in red that a lot of African people have no good coverage for HBV vaccination, less than 80%. But it's not the only factor of HBV transmission. There are additional factors like poor screening and poor knowledge about viral hepatitis B. In Africa, at-risk population is not screened properly. And for example, pregnant women, HIV, men who have sex with men, they are not screened for viral hepatitis B or C. It's also interesting to see that the population, but even the health care workers, are not aware of viral hepatitis B. It has been demonstrated in several small African studies. There is also another problem, 3.5% of health workers in Malawi were HPV positive, but they were not aware of their own statue. And if I'm correct, 10% of them were infected with HIV as well, and they were not aware of their own statue. So that's very serious. And there is also this small study, but I, f I find this study quite interesting because uh, we know that in Asia, and for example in Pakistan, barbers um, are represent an important route of transmission for viral hepatitis. Barbers in Karachi were asked for about viral hepatitis and only 11% of them were aware of viral hepatitis B or C. And in the field, in the Gambia, where I work, and I can tell you nobody is aware of, of viral hepatitis. A lot of people, they have a very good knowledge about HIV AIDS, but when you start discussing about viral hepatitis, nothing, no, nothing know exactly, nobody knows exactly what it is. That's another big issue in poor countries. Unsafe blood bank and unsafe medical procedures. That's pictures I took uh, in a small hospital where we work in the Gambia to give you an overview on the medical conditions in Africa. That's the TB lab, for example. 
And that's uh, actually that was in the Gambia, and this picture was taken in Guinea-Bissau, and it was supposed to be the theater of the hospital. According to WHO, less than 50% of blood supply in sub-Saharan Africa is screened for HBS antigen. That's very scary. To summarize, there is a combination of factors to explain the very high prevalence of liver cancer in poor countries. Early contamination, as I told you, but there is also the absence of treatment, but we will talk about that later. There are probably also virological factors with some specific genotype, like A1 and genotype C, that affect Africa and Asia, and these genotypes may be uh, associated with a higher risk of liver cancer. Host factors are also very important. Male genetic factors, poverty and low education, alcohol and co-infection, they are probably additional factors to explain the higher risk of uh, liver cancer. And also some environmental factors like aflatoxin, that is fungus infecting uh, greens in tropical areas. So there is finally another very important uh, explanation about this eye epidemic in poor country. It's probably the absence of interest from the international health agenda, I would say. Indeed, as you know, HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis have been mentioned as a priority uh, in the global health uh, agenda because HIV and malaria and TB belong to the Millennium Development Goals. If you look now, if you read the list of neglected disease, you will not read any word about viral hepatitis B or C. So viral hepatitis, they are not even neglected. They are totally forgotten. And this is an important slide because WHO launched its first um, day uh, on viral hepatitis only in May 2010. That's very recent. Another very important uh, factor of transmission in poor country is, of course, the limited access to treatment for viral hepatitis. As you can see on this slide, this is the price for one year of treatment. It's, it's crazy high, but Global Fund uh, can get interesting price for generic drugs and particularly for tenofovir. The problem with that, uh, tenofovir, for example, in, when it is paid by the Global Fund, it is focused for HIV subjects. There is a limited access um, for HBV treatment in poor countries. And the only drugs we have in poor countries, they are just limited to HIV-infected subjects. So in a sense, access to antiviral drug is very discriminating. If you are not HIV positive, you can't be treated for viral hepatitis B. It's nonsense. And I wanted to show you the very last campaign launched by the World Hepatitis Alliance, and I, I really like this picture. And it's very true, some patients, and I, we met a patient in the Gambia who wanted to be infected with HIV just to get the molecule against viral hepatitis. He had a viral hepatitis cirrhosis, and he couldn't, uh, this patient could not have access to tenofovir just because he was not HIV infected. So it's totally nonsense. The West African governments met each other together in Dakar, and they called WHO and even the pharmaceutical companies to provide, to reduce the price of the drugs and to increase attention to viral hepatitis in, in Africa. Fighting HBV in poor countries, I told you, is challenging, but uh, there are probably three important objectives. The identification of cases, the interruption of transmission, and the, the effective treatment, of course. 
So to identify cases, you need to screen the general population, but at least the at-risk population, pregnant women, MSM, HIV. Uh, and MSM, it's not easy. You know? For example, in the Gambia, <laughs> you don't talk about homosexuality at all. Okay, so screening men who have sex with men, it's almost impossible because nobody will tell you that he is homosexual. Uh, interrupting transmission, so of course it relies on immunization as we said, but public awareness, professional awareness, safe blood supply, safe medical practices. And treating effectively, it's not only treatment access, it's also diagnostic tools, doctors that have been trained, and uh, again, so skills and education. Uh, fighting hepatitis B needs, okay, immunization, education, screening, health system strengthening, capacity building access, uh, treatment access, but that can be done only in, part, in, in partnership with first the local governments, of course, the local population, but also in partnership with donors and developed countries and pharmaceutical companies. And this figure bring, uh, brings me to the Prolifica program. It's a project I'm working uh, on in the Gambia. It's very interesting because in my view, this program fits perfectly what this figure because we work in partnership with the Ministry of Health in Gambia, Senegal, Nigeria, and in partnership with Teaching Hospital. We work with villages, Alcalo, that means in Mandinka, chief of villages, but I will show you. And we work with the health centers, with the support of Euro the European Union, WHO, IARC, UK, Imperial College, MRC, and we have a strong support with Gilead, thanks to its access program. So I will finish this presentation by talking about Prolifica, the Prolifica program. So Prolifica means prevention of liver fibrosis in Africa. It uh, has been founded in 2011 by the European Union for a five-year uh, duration. The budget is three million euros. Uh, the project takes part in the Gambia, in Nigeria, and Senegal, so in West Africa, in collaboration, as I told you, with uh, MRC, WHO, Imperial College. And this program is a comprehensive program. There are two main studies. The WATCH study, West African Treatment Court for Viral Hepatitis B study, and there is also uh, HCC case control study. So I will give you an overview of these two uh, studies. The WATCH study has a primary objective uh, to determine whether the suppression of viral hepatitis B with an efficient molecule like tenofovir can reduce the risk of liver cancer in West Africa. The aim is to demonstrate that HBV replication can be effectively suppressed by a drug in West African populations. We aim at evaluating whether European treatment guidelines are applicable in West Africa because so far we have no uh, African guidelines, we will try to establish the efficacy of a population-based screening, clinical assessment and treatment in West Africa, because as I told you, screening is a huge problem in Africa. We will try to enumerate the proportion of, uh, of the adult population who are infected with HBV, and we will try to evaluate the proportion of the HBV-infected population who meet the easel criteria for the treatment. This watch study uh, is designed as, as follows. There is a first part of the study. It is a population-based screening for viral hepatitis B. So we screen all the Gambia. The Gambia is here inside the Senegal, tac, tac, tac. It's very small. <laughs> there are only two million inhabitants. But we work also in Senegal in some villages around uh, Dakar. Villages have been randomly selected and we screen this population. And then we have a second part of the study. It is a non-randomized uh, treatment cohort with a parallel observation cohort 
in the Gambia and in Senegal. The objective is to screen almost 15,000 uh, subjects, but at least 13 and 500,000 individuals in the Gambia and in Senegal. So we estimate that about 2,000 will be chronic HBV carriers, and we estimate that about 300 will be eligible for treatment with stenophovir. And so we will follow up this patient over the time, and we hope that we will show a decrease of the incidence of liver cancer. That's to show you uh, how we work. We work strongly with the population, with the villages, health centers, and so uh, a lot of villages have been randomly selected in the Gambia. Each village has its own chief uh, called Alcalo, and so we explain, we have posters, we have leaflets, a lot of things. We will also soon set up a radio podcast about viral hepatitis, and the population uh, meets us and we explain what is viral hepatitis and then we invite people for screening. Then we start, uh, we invite people, so it's very simple, huh? uh, that's the word, and okay, we sit down and people come and they are tested with a quick point of care test. Uh, we also take blood for DBS and so we confirm or not the positivity of the infection. DBS means dry blood spots, and so you put a small amount of uh, blood here, and so it's dried, and it's very use useful because uh, thanks to this method, you can assess a lot of things, and particularly the viral load, why not, and to confirm the infection. And so for poor country, it's... it's uh, very good method to screen the population because uh, it's very easy and you can keep this just in the fridge and then do the analysis in the lab. You just prick the finger, put a small amount of blood in this test and you wait 15 minutes for the result. So far we screened uh, in Senegal 1,400 subjects and we found a prevalence of almost 12%, so it's not very surprise, surprising. In the Gambia, uh, so far, we screened 1,752 subjects in different villages. Uh, it's amazing because the prevalence is very different from a village to another one. Uh, in some villages, the prevalence is only 4%. In other villages, it's 11%. But overall, the prevalence is 8 But we screen, we start by screening patients over 30 so far. And positive subjects are invited then to our clinic for medical, clinical examination, and a lot of uh, blood and virological investigation. We exclude from the study HIV, HCV patient and patient with renal failure because they won't be eligible for the treatment with stenophobia. And these patients have a fibro scan, liver sonography, and if needed, we do the liver biopsy to confirm severity of the liver disease, and I hope we will be also able to validate the fibro scan in this African population. We also invite 20% of randomly selected negative subjects for all this screening as to as a comparison, like as a LC controls. Then we select patients uh, eligible for uh, treatment with stenophobia according to the European guidelines, and we um, pr we we provide stenophobia for so far a five-year duration. This treatment, as I told you, is given by Gilead, and patients are followed uh, followed up the first month and then every three months. What about this HC4 case control study, that the second part of the Prolifica project? The objective is to develop a research platform for scientific studies of proteomics, metabolomics, molecular diagnosis, all this very sexy field on carcinogenesis. What we do in practice? We are two 
liver specialists in the Gambia, Dr. Ramujai, who is not here, and me. And uh, all the, case, the suspected cases of liver cancer are referred to our liver clinic, like this patient, she is 46. I have a lot of patients like that, to be honest. It's, it's the patient I see with liver cancer, they are quite young, with huge liver mass, though. So they are probably genetic and environmental factors. So we have to confirm this. I do li uh, sonography, alpha-fetoprotein, and if alpha-fetoprotein is over 400, we don't do liver biopsy. If not, we do liver biopsy like that. Okay, I'm not in the tumor, but I did also in non-tumoral <laughs> liver the liver biopsy. So, and we confirm all the cases. We freeze systematically. We freeze liver sample for further molecular analysis. So we build a biobank for liver cancer, and every sample are stored in MRC. So as I told you, we work in a very close partnership with uh, the government and the teaching hospital that the, the RVTH, Royal Victoria Teaching Hospital in Banjul. It's quite simple. We built this uh, room for liver consultation and we try to train and teach uh, young doctors in the Gambia. Uh, we also try to transfer competence and to build capacity in terms of clinics, but also lab activities. And for example, we set up this uh, in-house PCR for the viral load quantification for this price, two euros per test, and we work in strong collaboration with Fabien Zulim, uh, the INSERM unit in France. And so the objective, of course, is to keep the liver activities when the project will be finished. So to conclude about this very exciting subject, HBV, as I showed you, is responsible for a greater burden of disease uh, than appreciated. Management of HBV in developing countries is challenging. Vaccination remains an important component of the strategy, but education, screening, and treatment are also required. Need for innovative technology solution to facilitate treatment of viral hepatitis in poor countries is crucial indeed. And I just want to remind you that Prolifica project is the first access treatment project for viral hepatitis B in sub-Saharan Africa beyond to the field of HIV. I think it's a crucial project. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much.